in a world where there are no negative numbers, subtraction can still exist. Hello and welcome back to another video. Today, we'll be doing a deep dive into how computers subtract using the method of complements. Oh yeah, the seemingly basic task gets complex once you realize how computers store and represent numbers. If you're a computer scientist, you may already be familiar with many of these concepts, or at least the premise behind them. However, for the sake of completeness, we'll start from the ground up. That means we'll go back to binary basics and talk about the fundamentals like decimal versus binary and so on. You may want to skip past that, we have links in the video description and on the timeline for you to do that. The second part is the start of the show, where we go into the method of complements, both in general terms as well as specifically in computer science. So with that preamble out of the way, let's jump in. Let's start by going back to binary basics. How do computers count? What are numbers to a computer anyway? The way we count as people is using the decimal number system, also known as base 10. That means that for each digit in a number, we have 10 possible symbols from 0 to 9. However, a computer doesn't represent numbers that way. They only use the absence or presence of a voltage to represent data. In other words, every digit can only take on one of two possible states, which we call base 2 or binary. While a single binary digit, also known as a bit, doesn't sound very useful on its own, it becomes powerful when you string multiple bits together. Different combinations of ones and zeros come together to represent different quantities. We can even convert them back to decimal to make them easier to understand. Take this bit string for example. If we take each bit to represent an increasing power of 2, what we can then do is to have each bit act as a switch. If it's 1, its corresponding power of 2 is switched on. Otherwise, it is switched off. We take all those numbers, add them together, and we have our decimal conversion. If you think about it, this method works for any base, including base 10. Just take powers of 10 instead, and you'll see. But as all the cool academics say, we'll leave this as an exercise for the reader. Now, don't forget, computers only have ones and zeros and nothing else. No decimal points, no negative signs, just ones and zeros. So if you want to represent a negative number, you have to allocate one of those bits to act as a sign, while still having the rest of the bits make sense as a number. We're going to briefly cover three approaches to doing this, which I know is probably two ways too many, but bear with me. The simplest method is to set the leftmost bit to be a sign bit. If it's one, the number is negative. The rest of the bits represents the number as always, and is read off in the same way as before. This method is known as sign and magnitude. Another method is called one's complement. The first bit still represents the sign, but the rest of the number is also inverted. That is, the ones become zeros and the zeros become ones. We call this a not operation. Yet another method is two's complement. We do the same as one's complement, but we also add one to the number. This is the method we're primarily interested in, so let's walk through an example. Say, you want to represent the number negative 6 in binary. You have 5 bits to play with, and you want to use 2's complement. Here's how you do it. Start by representing the value of positive 6 using powers of 2. That's 2 plus 4, or 2 to the power of 1 plus 2 to the power of 2. So we light up those 2 bits. Of course, what we really want is the complement. So let's start by generating a once complement by performing a NOT operation on the entire bit string, inverting every bit. From the once complement, we add 1, carry the 1, and we get this answer. To interpret this value then, we simply look at the most significant bit, the one on the extreme left. If it's 1, we know it's a negative number. To figure out its value, we do the exact same process, flip all the bits, then add 1. When we read it off, we get positive 6. That tells us then that the complemented value must be negative 6. Sometimes in class, we stop here, which is a pity because we don't see just how powerful these representations are. But of course, to understand that, we must first answer one fundamental question. Why are there so many ways to represent negative numbers? Why don't you just pick one method and stick to it? Well, turns out, beyond wanting just a representation of negative numbers, we are also looking for a functional representation. That is, 
this negative representation would need to actually behave like a negative number once we start to do arithmetic operations. That's why we're doing such intricate complement operations in the first place. To understand the method of complements and why it creates a functional negative number representation, let's first go back to decimal, number system that we use day to day. What if you add a negative number to a positive one? Even though the operation you're doing is explicitly addition, you can still achieve the result of a subtraction. That's a behavior we'd like to replicate on a computer, which, if you recall, has no notion of subtraction or even negative signs. Let's first try to understand this process in base 10. Let's try and do a simple subtraction between two numbers, say 1000 minus 388. Except let's make life a little harder for ourselves by disallowing the use of the subtraction operator on negative numbers. So we need some functional representation of negative 388, such that by doing an addition, we'll still get the correct result. One caveat we need to note is that the length of the number, in other words, the number of digits in it, must be fixed using this method. In this case, we're sticking to four decimal digits. The process to derive a complement is similar to what we've seen earlier with binary numbers. First, flip the number, then add one. Of course, flipping is a little less trivial when you have more than just two possible digits. There are a few ways to understand this flip. The easiest way is to think of this as a mapping. The biggest possible digit is mapped to the smallest possible, the second largest to the second smallest, and just move down the line and continue. Of course, the alternative is to simply think about this as 10 minus each digit. Though, strictly speaking, we're still in a world in which subtraction isn't available, and I plan to play by the rules here. All right, so let's try to generate the complement of 388. We're working with four digit numbers, so let's pad that out to 0388. Then, we flip each digit using our mapping to find their counterparts, giving us 9611. Don't forget to add one. This gives us 9612. Huh, that can't be right. Are you saying that this number 9612 is somehow mathematically alike negative 388? Strange, but let's have faith and push on. Recall that instead of doing 1000 minus 388, we can do 1000 plus negative 388. Since we found that 9612 is the complement of negative 388 and I claim that they're functionally equivalent, let's instead do 1000 plus 9612. This gives us the answer 10612. That's still not right. Ah, but don't forget, we're working in a domain of four digit numbers. So we have to drop the overflow to get just 612. If you were to compute 1000 minus 388, you'll find that that is in fact the exact correct answer. The method works. So summary, the complement of a number is like a positive reflection of a negative number. It might not look very similar, but it's crafted so that mathematically it behaves the same way. As long as you remember to throw out the overflow, of course. Try it yourself, maybe with slightly bigger numbers like, well, I don't know, 7654321 minus 1234567. That could be fun. But once again, I'm leaving that as an exercise for the reader. Going back to binary then, let's see how this can help us. Let's say we want to compute this subtraction using 6-bit numbers. We pad out the 1010, flip its bits, then add 1 to produce 110110. We can now add the numbers together instead of subtracting them, and remembering to drop the overflow, we get one followed by four zeros. To verify that this is correct, we can convert all the numbers to decimal. We're really computing 26 minus 10, and the answer converts to 16, which of course is correct. So what this tells us is that with a bit of clever math, you don't really need to have a negative sign or know about negative numbers to perform subtraction. And now, we also know why we go to all this trouble. Complements give us positive numbers that work like negative numbers in calculations. Of course, as miraculous as this technique is, it does have a couple of limitations and caveats. Firstly, the number of digits is fixed. This means potentially less flexibility in storing and representing numbers. 
Another issue is while this accounts for almost all of the complemented binary representations, it doesn't really explain the existence of one's complement. This, more broadly speaking, is called the diminished radix complement. It's almost correct, but gives us an answer that's off by one. In general, this representation is poor because it has two versions of zero, a positive and a negative one. Two's complement fixes this problem by shifting all the negative numbers ahead to cover up the extra zero, which is what the plus one operation achieves. The same thing exists in decimal, and is called the nines complement. In my research for this video, I wasn't able to find any direct application of the diminished radix complement, but I might be wrong. This appears to be just an intermediate step to get the full radix complement. And there you go, you now have everything you need to understand and apply complemented numbers in the world of binary, as well as with decimal numbers, of course. In fact, you can easily extend this method to any base. Just derive a mapping for each digit, flip them all, then add one. This gets you a complement, your mirror number. Remember that the lengths of your numbers are now fixed. Do the addition, discard the overflow, and you have the results of a subtraction. Try it in, say, B16 hexadecimal. Again, this shall be left as an exercise for the reader, though in retrospect, I don't suppose you're actually reading this video. If you ever need to verify your answer, I've built a handy calculator for you to use. Simply key in the numbers you want to do a subtraction operation on, set the base and the length, and watch as my code does all the necessary working to produce an answer. That's all there is for this episode. Have fun with this powerful technique. And until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with NerdFirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video and are feeling generous, a donation to this channel will be greatly appreciated. There's a link on screen and in the video description for more details. Meanwhile, please do like, comment, and subscribe. This helps the channel tremendously and gives me the means to do more. Thank you once again, and I'll see you next time.